Tere, hommikust ka minu poolt. Ma täna on väga korraldajaid. Kutse eest tulla täna siia ja modereerima arutelu ja otsingut Euroopa hingejärgi. Ma täna on ka austatud kuulajaid, kes on tulnud siin seda küsimus meiega koos arutama. Mina ei olnud veel nelja aastane, kui minu vanemad võtsid mu käe otsa ja põgenesid minuga Eestist. Nad põgenesid nõukogude liidu võimu eest, sest nad tahtsid, et nende laps kasvaks vabaduses. Ja nii me jõudsimegi põgenikena Lääne Saksamaale kus meile anti ja süüli ja ma kasvasin üles. Ja mul oli õnn kasvada üles täiskasvanute seas, kes andsid iga päev oma töö jõu ja tahte selle nimel, et ka Eesti saaks ühel päeval jälle vaba demokraatlik riik olla. Ning see unistus sai täide ja minu lapsed on täna juba sündinud vabas Eestis. Nii, see tähendab, et minu Euroopa on demokraatia, on õigusriik, on inimeste õiguste kaitse. Aga kust ma võtan, et kõik teised saavad sellest Euroopas täpselt samuti aru, nagu minagi? Minagi. USA president Franklin D. Roosevelt ütles, et demokraatiaks peavad olema tagatud neli vabadust. Sõnavabadus ja usuvabadus, vabadus hirmus ja vabadus puudusest. Peale teist maailma sõda luudud Euroopa majandusühendus tugineb ka neljale vabadusele. Kaupade Ja teenuste ja kapitali ja inimeste vabale liikumisele. Inimõiguste kaitse muutus Euroopa ilu õiguse osaks alles 70. aastate keskel. Ja õigusriigi kirjutasime esmakordselt Euroopa liidu aktides 90. aastatel. Me võime öelda, et... Me oleme majanduslikult edukad olnud. Me oleme, meil on hea koos äri teha, aga kui me vaatame väärtusi, siis tekib küsimus, kas nende osas on meil ikka ühtne aru saam. Kui me räägime õigusriigist ja vaatame Ungari ja Poola vastu algatatud rikkumismenetlusi, siis tekib küsimus, kas me kõik saame sellest õigusriigist ikka samamoodi aru. Ja kui ma räägin Brexiti pooldajale, et mina olen, minu arvates esindab Euroopa vabadust, siis ma eeldan, et ta ei pruugi minuga nõustuda. Nii et siin on ka räägitud majanduslikust Euroopast. Võibolla me peaksime hoopis tagasi sinna poole pöörduma. Ma küsin kõidi provokatiivselt. Kuna me võime ju kõik selles kokku lepida, et äri on meil hea teha koos. Euroopa liidu toetusel on palju ära tehtud, palju taristud, ehitatud ka meil Eestis ja mujal. Milleks meil siis ikkagi on neid väärtusi vaja, kui näid meid kogu aeg panevad, nagu siin ka tunne kela ütles kuristiku kõik äärel kõndima. Kui me võib olla uppis, lepiksime kokku, et me ei olegi midagi enamat, keskendume majanduslikule pühendusele. Nii et huviga ma kuulan ja ootan panelistide seisukohtiga selle kohta, milleks meil nüüd need väärtusi siiski vaja on, kui nad meil kogu aeg panevad oma vahel tülitsema. Korralduslikult poolelt veel põgusalt nii palju, et Kuna kaks meie panelisti ei ole eestikeelselt, 
siis külalis lahkuses ma lähen vahepeal üle inglis keelele ja loodan teie mõistvale suhtumisele ja sünkroon tõlkele ning sellega ka ma juhataks juba üle meie esimese esinaja juurde, kes siis on justiitsminister Urmas Reinsalu. Urmas Reinsalu on erakond isamaa eestseisude liige. Ta on endine erakonna esimees. Ta on töötanud presidendi kantselei direktorina. Teda on kolmel korral valitud riigikokkui ja ta on olnud ka Eesti kaitseminister. Urmas Reinsalu oli justiitsminister ka aastal 2017. Ehk Eesti eesistumise ajal Euroopa Liidu nõukogus. Seega, kui me räägime Euroopa hingest, siis ma olen päris kindel, et justiitsminister teab omast kogemusest meile rääkida, kui lihtne või raske on leida see ühine eesmärk mis erinevad Euroopa Liidu liikmesriigid siis ühes suunas liikuma paneb. Ning sellega ma annaks jutujärgu üle justiitsministrile. Aitäh! Head sõbrad Euroopast, head sõbrad Eestist. Solidaarsusest! Räägitakse minu jaoks liiga palju viimasel ajal, kui kohustusest teha midagi, millest see sai usu, kui kohustusest täita mingid ülesandes, mida keegi teine on tegemata jätnud. Ma kuulsin selle nädalaste Karl Marksid sitaati. Tema käsitlus solidaarsusest oli see, et selleks, et saada midagi, mida sa oled välja teeninud, tuleb väga palju pingutada. Mulle see mõtted, et see meeldis. Ära tsurinda mainis Mart Laari. Mina osutan Edgar Savisaarele. Edgar Savisaare poliitiku tähelend algas, kes mäletab Vikergaares ühest artiklist, mille pealkirja oli Kredo. Olen eestlane kommunist ja inimene. Ja rahvas ahetas, julge mees, ütles välja, et on kommunist eestlane, saab olla korraga. Aga tegelikuses, kui me räägime tänases Euroopa muredest, hirmudest ja inimeste pealt olekust, on küsimus selles, et inimesed tahavad identiteeti. Nad tahavad olla ka see eestlased või slovakid või sakslased. Nad tahavad identiteeti läbi oma soo, läbi oma juurte, läbi oma usu. Ja tunne ja mure, et see identiteet mureneb, on väga paljuski Euroopa tänane väljakutse. Kui me vaatame Eestis viimasel ajal, on meil tekinud vahva mood ehitada uusi kirikuid. Kuidas siis nõnda? Euroopa üks kõige sekulaarsemaid ühiskondi kirikutes käib tegelikuses ju igapäevaselt teenistustel väga vähe inimesi, aga korraga rajatakse uusi kirikuid. Kirikud on tühjadega rajatakse uusi kirikuid. Jõgevale tahetakse, mustamäele rajatakse. Ma arvan, et see on sümbul. See ei ole küsimus mitte religioonist, vaid see on küsimus sellest, et inimesed tahavad oma identiteeti ka siin Eestis kinnistada. Ja selle väljenduseks on need pühakodade rajamise mõtte. See ei ole kitselt usuline küsimus, et see on tegelikus midagi muud. Inimesed tahavad oma vaimselt pärandit säilitada, tunda kuuluvusest uhkust. Euroopa on... Õigusriiklus, humanism, Euroopa vaimupärand ja religioosne pärand. Ja seda me peame hoidma. Aga Euroopa identiteedist kõneledes on selge, et Euroopa identiteet on rahvusriikide summa ja ühisosa. Lisaks nendele vaimsetele Ateena ja Jeruusalema ja Rooma õiguse kiirgusele, mis meid saadab. Nii siis Euroopa kui rahvusriigid. Aga räägime asjast. Täna hommikul ma lugesin ühte artiklit, mis ilmus 2012. aastal ajales The Guardian, mille autorid olid Peter Sutherland ja ka tänane Euroopa Komisjoni võlinik Cecilia Malmström, liberaal. Ma tsiteerin. 
<laughs> ja nüüd inglise keeles. European countries must finally and honestly acknowledge that like US, Canada and Australia, they are lands of immigrants. The percentage of foreign-born residents in several European countries, including Spain, UK, Germany, Netherlands and Greece, is similar to that in the US. See on väga põhimõtteline kreedo. See on kreedo sellest, et tegelikuses me oleme muutunud või muutumas migrantide ühiskonnaks. Nagu Ameerika ühendriigid, mis Ameerika ühendriigid teatavasti ei ole rahvusriik. Ja miks see on tegelikult tänasel päeval väga oluline? Mitte sellepärast, et me Eestis on meil kaks kolmandiku põlisrahvast eestlasi ja üks kolmandik teiste rahvuste esindajaid, vaid sellepärast, et Peter Sutherland, kes on meie hulgas lahkunud selle aasta alul, oli tegelikult kandis vastutust ÜRO's kui kõrge volinik migratsiooni küsimustes. Tema oli see ideoloog, kes kujundas ÜRO migratsiooni pakti. Tema püstitas sellele migratsiooni paktile, rände paktile, mida me arutame, räägime asjast ka, andis tegelikult selle ideoloogia. Migratsioon kui jõukuse ja heaolu allikas, kui ennekõike kui majanduslik kategooria, see on Sutherlandi filosoofia, mida ta koos Cecilia Malmström ka siin selgelt välja toob. Selleks, et me saaksime tagada majandusliku heaolu, peame olema immigrantide ühiskond. Kuna Euroopa rahvad vananemad, kuna meil ei ole võimalik tagada sellist heaolu taset. Olles 10% maailma rahvastikust, Euroopa riigid kulutavad 50% sotsiaalhoolekande kuludest. Nii on öelnud Proa Merkel. See ei ole jätkusuutlik. Küsimus on selles, kas jätkusuutlikus on tegelikuses see, et läbi migratsiooni see sotsiaalne heaolu tase tagad. Ma arvan, et see on väga põhimõtteline filosoofiline debatt sellest, mis tähendab küsimusidentiteedist. Nüüd on siin kõlanud viimasel ajal väiteid, ma olen nende selle debatti mõjuvalde peata mõistma, on otse kui see migratsiooni pakt ei ole õiguslikult siduv. Ei ole üldse siduv. Eesti poliitikud võttes kuskilt õhust oma kompetentsi rahvusvahelise õiguse segastes normides väljendavad seda väga ühe mõtteliselt, kes on selle apologeedid olnud. Täna hommikul saime ma kätte Saksama kõige kaalukama rahvusvahelise õiguse institutsiooni Heidelbergi Max Plankki rahvusvahelise õiguse instituudi direktori analüüsi, mis puudutas rändelepet. Võib öelda, et kui Saksamal keegi on üldse, kelle sõna maksab rahvusvahelise õiguse ekspertina, siis on see see inimene, doktor Anne Peters. Ja ma tsiteerin tema analüüsi, lasin selle tõlkida ära eesti keelde. Tõlge on korrektne juriidiline tõlge, mitte nagu Orwelli uulitsest tehtud, kus sõna kohustus, kommitment on asendatud sõnaga pühendumus. Muidugi on see kohustus. Ja ma tsiteerin, tsiteerid jalgus. Rände kokkulepe õiguslike funksioone võiks käsitleda nii nimetatud õiguseelsete. Pre-law, paraõiguse, paraloo ja õiguslisa, law plus funksioonidega. Kokkuleppes esitavud tekst saab olla õiguseelne tekst, mis käitub tugeva õiguseelkäijana, ehk sillutab teed ametlikule lepingule. Samuti võib see kaasa tuua rahvusvahelise tavaõiguse väljakujunamise. Tsitaadi lõpp ja teine tsitaad. Samuti võivad pehme õiguse tekstid, nagu rände kokkuleppe, olla suuniseks tugeva õiguse tõlgendamisel, tugeva õigusega hõlmatud kohustuste täpsustamisel ja konkreetsemaks muutmisel. Näiteks võib kokkuleppe lisada mõningaid üksikasju kohustustele, mis tulenevad konvensioonidest kodakondsuse kohta ja ÜRO konvensioonist rahvusvahelis organiseeritud kuritegusu vastu võitlemise kohta. Kokkuleped kasutavad ka riigisesed asutused ja kohtud riigises ja õiguse tõlgendamiseks. Samuti võib see toimida kui parameeter kaalutlusõiguse rakendamisel riiklike haldusasutuste poolt. See ka üldiselt, ütleb Saksamma, kõige autoriteetseima rahvusvahelis õiguse institutsiooni juht ekspertina, ei ole rände kokkuleppe algirjastamine õiguslikust seisukohast ebaoluline. Sitaadi lõpp. Ja nii ongi. Ja seda ei maksa häbeneda. Selle rände leppe eesmärk on lahendada globaalseid probleeme, mis puudutavad majanduslikku heaolu küsimusi inimkonnale. Kui migratsioon, kui majanduskasvu üks võimalike selgeid legitiimseid allikaid. See ongi selle rände 
raamistiku keskne missiooni tõnum. Migratsioon on olnud läbi aegade inimkonna jaoks jõukuse heaalu loomise üks platform. Küsimus on selles, et millised on need tagajärjad Eesti perspektiivist vaadates ja kas me peame seda mõistlikult sõmitte. Siin, ma arvan, lähevad seisukohad lahku. Aga mis ei tähenda seda, otse kui meie ei jagaks vastutust, mis puudutab ebaseaduslikku rände korraldamist, mis puudutab humanitaarkatastroopide vältimist, mis puudutab seda, et inimõigused peavad olema võõrandamatud ja inimväärikus. Inimkannatusi tuleb vähendada kristlikust ja üldinimlikust halastusest tulenevalt. Eelmisel kolmapäeval Eesti Vabariigi riigogu võttis vastu hääletusel 11 sõjalist missiooni. Me saadame välja maailma. Me saadame oma sõdurit vajadusel surema, et lahendada maailmas olulisi probleeme, mis puudutab inimkannatuste leevendamist konflikti piirkondadest. Mitte keegi sa öelda, et see ei ole osa meie väikese riigi vastutusest inimkonna üldise kannatuste leevendamise vallas. Kui tuua paraleele selles küsimuses arvestades meie nii keerulist demograafilist olukorda ja nii suurt ajalooliselt okupatsiooni aja põhjustest tulenevat migratsiooni osakaalu, siis me peame selgelt aru saama. Meie vastus nendes küsimustes on üks ja selge, et rahvusriik on meie jaoks ainumõeldav riiklik olemise vorm ja selle eelduseks, et ta Eesti rahvusriik püsib, on see, et eestlased peavad olema siin maal enamuses. Nii lihtne see ongi. Kui me kõneleme sellest ja vaatame migratsiooni, nende on nende riikide, Euroopa Liidu liikmesriikide, legitiimsed poliitilised valikud, gastarbeiterid Saksamaal, majanduskasvu võimestamine läbi pärast teist maailmasõda sisserande majandusmigratsiooni võimendamise teel, need on nende riikide valikud olnud. Aga kui me oleksime kas või kahe inimpõlve jooksul kujutame ette, lisaks sellele nendele tagajärgedele, mida oleme kogunud okupatsiooni ajal migratsiooni läbi, rakendanud seda tüüpi migratsiooni poliitikat, nagu mõningad Euroopa liikmesriigid, oleksime me täna vähemuses. Siin ole küsimust. See on puhtal kujul mehaaniliste numbrite teema. Kõneleda nüüd, et otse kui selle migratsiooni või rändelepega mitte ühinemine tähendab meie välispoliitilisest põhimõttetest lahku ütlemist, on jamps. Meie välispoliitilised põhimõtted on esiteks see, et meie ülimväärtus on see, et Eesti riiklik iseseisvus jääb püsima ja meie rahvusriik jääb kestma. Kõik poliitilised, praktilised otsustused peavad olema allutatud sellele eesmärgile. Siin on toodud paraleeli, et kui me sellele rändelepele vastu oleme, siin on öelnud ametnikud ja poliitikud, siis tabab meid kurisaatus, aga sellest räägime lähemalt. Aitäh! Siudis siin ka kohe päeva poliitika juurde rääkides Euroopa hingest. And now I'm very happy to welcome George Hölveni from Hungary. He is a member of the European Parliament and a member of the European People's Party Group and as such also co-chair of the group's working group for interreligious dialogue. He has also been the Hungarian Secretary of State for Relations with Churches, National Minorities and Civil Society. Judge Helveni was politically active already during Hungary's accession period to the EU, and he has also been actively representing and promoting Christian democratic values in other EU candidate countries. Therefore, I think questions concerning Europe's soul and values are uh, without any doubt no unknown territory to you, and I'm very happy to hand you over the floor. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are on late, and I try to be very quick. 
and all the time the station is not the first thing that the size of drive rep land to others, the first rep yeah. uh, Many, many thanks to Mr. Uh, Kellam Tuna that you was able to produce with the help of course uh, uh, your colleagues uh, with the institution this kind of open, uh, really deep discussion. It's not easy. It's not a common thing in the European Parliament. We have a lot of discussions, but so so deep and so honest and openly, it's uh, maybe in our working group for interreligious dialogue exists. Uh, why? Uh, we try to, in you know, my working group, in our working group, uh, we have one sentence: bring the people together. And I think it's this, it's this up, it should be one of the main guidelines. We are looking for something in Europe, in country, in my village, in my uh, city, in my community, what we keep us together. And I think it's, it's a crucial point. Um, I get 10 minutes, and really to, to get 10 minutes such, to, to, uh, to talk about such a kind of deep thing, it's really impossible. Yeah, this is really like the 800 meter run, yeah? and you know, it's, it's not short, not long, yeah? So on this reason, I, I really, I will really read it. I was thinking about, but really, again, thanks for the opportunity. I try to conclude in my contribution uh, in uh, some concrete uh, points. First, do not be afraid. All nations had a very strong common experience in the modern history. This is reflected well in the historical homily of the Saint John Paul II and the inauguration of the pontificate in 1978. Turning point for us in Central Eastern Europe, as I personally believe. Do not be afraid. Open wide the doors for Christ. To his saving power, open boundaries of states, economic and political system, vast fields of culture, civilization and development. Do not be afraid. These words give the encouragement, I think, is for a lot of us against the totally uh, inhumane regimes in Europe uh, after years. The second point, the soul of Europe, the title. Just after Central Europe has changed the regimes, uh, Jacques Delors, a socialist, as uh, Tuna mentioned, that uh, Mr. Nkela mentioned already, the socialist president of the communism presented the ideas on the soul of Europe. And I truly appreciate the intention of this uh, conference uh, to better understand the European soul. Has to be, has the courage to talk about the soul today in the European Union. This speech of Jacques Delors from 1992 sounds rather astonishing today. Let me quote his sentence on Europe. There is not a place in the world where relations between the individual and the society are better harmonized. I believe this is due to the influence of the Christianity. He explains here not less but the basic contribution uh, uh, of Christianity to building community in Europe. I truly, I truly believe that traditional communities face historical challenges today in Europe. We shall think of the family or religious communities. Certainly, we must understand again the thousand years old impact of Christianity in Europe. Uh, third point, Europe represents dignity. There is currently a general sentiment among the people. Europe has a past, but not, uh, not a future. Similar opinion exists uh, even among politicians. On the contrary to this pessimistic approach, I want to talk about the Europe opportunities. I wish to talk about the hope of Europe, bearing in mind, of course, all the difficulties. Europe represents a unique value in human history. Europe represents dignity. We must preserve the dignity. We shall protect this for the benefits of everyone. I just know one kind of dignity if someone deserves to be called human.
that was a famous Hungarian writer, uh, Geza Gadmi. During the history of Europe has attempted and force of dignity of the person and that of the community. This common European heritage is under treat today from many sides. And in many respects, we are the cause of certainty, as I believe. We must start, therefore, with self-examination, not with the others. All the time, we put the responsibility for the others. In myself, when I want to realize the new common Europe, what has remained for all me valuable heritage? What is all my own responsibility, only respect if I am politician or academical or something really in the leader position. Fourth, alarm bell a ringing sooner in Central Eastern Europe. I do not say that we Central Europeans would know the exclusive solution. It's not true, we know it, for, uh, for the future of Europe especially. In Central Eastern Europe, however, we have a special historical experience. We might say that all alarm bell is ringing sooner. I mean, we are able to recognize historical moments earlier. Our sense for danger is more clear. We often don't know, rather, we don't know, rather feel that we are not on the right way. We Hungarians, just uh, the others, always looked forward in Western Europe during the years of communism. We wanted independence, freedom of religion, existential security, among others. And in reality, we are more happy or less happy. In reality, we could not fully find that we imagined when we the, fall, uh, the wall fell down. Maybe this was the, 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 the change of the Western life, which is still taking place all days. The Central Eastern European countries are living under the rule of law for almost three decades. In this context, we still try to eliminate the leftovers of communism. This should be not confused with the respect of natural left-wing thinking. Some political and civil society forced uh, in countries where, or want to wash this uh, together. There is a serious consequences uh, of all, uh, all of us. The history and the character of Central Eastern Europe must be considered more profoundly to able to reunite the Europe in the 21st century. The answers of Central Eastern Europe must be understood better than so far. Fifth, as I said, the post-communist countries still fight with their difficulties arising from the past. The same time, after 50 years freedom in Western Europe and a lot of complicated uh, post-communist syndromes, we have in both parts of Europe, the same psychological, sociological problems as we do. Why? For me, it's a phenomenal question. I don't know the answer. Freedom cannot be believe, uh, believed in the same place where we have been in captivity, said the Nobel Prize winner Imre Kertis in Budapest. But we Europeans are sentenced to Europe. We must modify, therefore, our understanding of freedom. How can we formulate this? I make a short, that I try to keep my time. Uh, it's very interesting, maybe it's there. Uh, this point six, common consumption doesn't create community. I consider the generational conflict of all times another basic challenge. Two years ago, Pope Francis said, in, Pope Francis said the following at the mayor conference under the title Resinking in Europe. I was from here, so with two meters. Uh, it was never quoted in the press. An unprecedented general, uh, generational conflict has been taking place since uh, the, the 60s. Europe has a kind of memory deficit. 
to become owns, uh, once or more of a solid community means rediscovering the value of our own past. It's a very, for me, it's a very important that common consumption that doesn't create community. It actually prevents the creation of any community. Through consumption, the individual places themselves in the, the center of existence, or in the center of the creation, as faithful would say. Economy is absolutely needed. We need a common market. It's no question, out of question. But it's not enough. It doesn't exist Nike society. I hope so. Uh, at this point, I have to raise very shortly, only to mention the significance of the family. Today, in the uh, European Parliament, to talk about the role of the family, family is almost impossible. Like in the 80s in my country. We talk about, talk about the role of the religion in European society, as well as it's almost impossible. But the family is not a re religious creation. It's not a traditional. That is, you know, it's a very well educated, highly educated, promoted a lawyer here. It's just naturale. How can we restore the value of the family? Family means already much more than business association. The family has a secret vocation. This vocation is derived from the human nature. Communities can be built only on the base of the families. Without this, it's really this new future. We have to think about it. And really the last point, Christian democracy. It will be very personal. We are talking about personal solidarity, and we're talking about subsidiarity. It's very crucial points. But I think it's very existential to start for myself. I am not in the middle of the <laughs> creation. It's very important, you know. But I have the responsibility first uh, of me, about me. As a Christian Democrat politician, I have my weaknesses, just as others. But I have the guideline. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it in the haven. To be clear, I am the Christian Democrat only when I work on that purpose. Your will be done. We have to work together. How should Christian Democrat be like in the 21st century? The words of teaching must be my guideline, my guiding line. And let me uh, recall finally once more the Holy Pope of the attention of the today. Do not be afraid. Open wide doors for Christ. And honestly and openly, my biggest challenge in my life as a politician to make this understandable. And it's crucial, we didn't mention yet, but we have to talk about for the next generation, the next generation, and for those who don't share my belief, but uh, they are full with goodwill. This is for me, and I think it's for us, the major exercise. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you very much, George Helveni. So now I see we're over time, but anyhow, I think it's important that we give here everyone also the possibility to speak and say what he or she thinks. Our last but not least uh, speaker is uh, Daniel Mitov from Bulgaria. He is currently director of the Eurasia program of the U.S. National Democratic Institute. The U.S. National Democratic Institute is a non-governmental organization that uh, supports democratic institutions and practices all over the world. Daniel Mitov has been uh, the Institute's representative in Libya, in Ukraine, Yemen, um, Tunisia, and elsewhere, and also in uh, Brussels. And he has also served as the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Bulgaria. Therefore, your 
experience um, as an active promoter of democratic values as well as your political experience have uh, without doubt uh, taught you how well or not um, the ideas of um, politics and um, the ideas of a common soul and values uh, go together. Thank you. The floor is yours. Thank you very much indeed. I hope, uh, I hope this works. I'm not really sure whether I'm not very good with these things. Right, there's, there's another microphone here. Uh, well, first, uh, thank you very much for the, for the invitation. Uh, I will try to, I will try to, uh, to speak uh, today. I've been taking, taking off my NDI hat, uh, putting it aside. I will try to speak as, uh, as a proud European. Uh, as someone who cares about the European Union and the recent challenges in front of it, uh, and as someone who who has dealt with uh, with those challenges in one of the uh, most tumultuous recent times during the migration crisis and so on, uh, the annexation of Crimea and other other beauties which has happened recently unfortunately uh, having in mind that uh, there was a lot of talk about uh, about religion i remember the a joke i'm not going to to go into that but um, uh, not so long time ago a friend of mine uh, reflecting on on europe said something that i found uh, quite quite funny he said european union uh, is uh, uh, resembles a, a little bit like uh, um, uh, Roman Catholic marriage. Uh, you get you get married, and there's no possibility for divorce. Uh, the European Union has been, from the very beginning, um, uh, from its very inception, planned as as a project where you can get in, but you cannot get out. Maybe this is going to change very soon with Brexit. We'll see what will happen there. Uh, but moving ahead, uh, unfortunately, politics in, uh, in today's world looks very much like a choice between uh, Thomas Hobbes and Thomas Jefferson. Um, those who label themselves as populists today or nationalists are declaring that they're trying to bring down the administrative leviathan called Brussels, a monster in their, in their eyes. Uh, and on the other hand, those who want the survival of the European Union and even ever closer union are trying to prevent them from destroying the EU uh, and prevent them from creating their own smaller, private, intimate, Levi uh, intimate Leviathans uh, who will serve one purpose only, the return of the international uh, architecture to some kind of a Westphalian system where absolute sovereignty stays on top of the global value system, uh, human, and, and in the meantime, human rights, um, freedom and democracy are swept somewhere under the carpet and never mentioned in international relationship. The soul of Europe has been already very well defined. Um, I don't think I have to say much more than what has been already said. It could be framed very well within those values which we call the values of liberal democracy. Uh, the question, though, for me, is how to prevent that very soul from leaving the body. The rise uh, of what we see right now has nothing to do with... Uh, uh, with, with um, uh, preserving those, those values we are talking about. What needs to be preserved today, uh, what needs to be protected, um, are a state and institutions which don't steal, which are transparent, um, media which is free and does not lie, uh, courts which respect the rights of all, Elections which are free and fair, pluralism which guarantees that every citizen who doesn't like the politics of the government can express that sentiment without the fear of institutional retribution or persecution. Uh, 
Of course, democracy, liberal democracy is not, is not perfect. We all know that. It has its failures. Uh, but the failures of a good system are not a reason to turn to an evil one. The truth is, though, that social constructs, being empires or unions in the past, have ceased to exist when the leaders of those communities stopped believing in the fundamental principles which glued them together in the first place. In the minute in which we continue repeating ourselves that liberal democracy is failing, it's going to fail for sure. Uh, in the minute in which we stop believing that the, the values that glued us together uh, throughout the years are not working, that is, that is going to be the reality. If the political leaders, or the so-called elite, even if I hate this term, uh, believe that something cannot happen, it will not happen. Uh, for decades, the European political elites have told the Europeans that ever deeper economic integration will ultimately lead to a political union. And decades later, we are in a situation where the political union is still in a very unclear and murky state. We live in this perpetual situation where the nation state can no longer, and in the meantime, the European Union cannot yet. Somewhere there in the middle. I hope this was, this was clear enough. I'm, I'm worried about the translation of this bit. Uh, the constant search for some middle ground solutions and balances led to us to the situation when nation states and European institutions are blocking each other. Two main questions I think are vital for understanding why we are in the situation uh, in which we are today. Migration and economy um, addressing the economy, trade, and uh, the, the, the financial system in general. The migration and security are one of the biggest issues for, for the Europeans today. Uh, all the politicians, uh, all the Euro European politicians preferred, including myself, preferred in the past not to see certain problems which have been arising little by little, uh, until the moment of the migration crisis uh, of 2015 hit us hard, and we did, know, did not know how to react. The, the European citizens uh, gained the feeling that their leaders cannot protect them, they cannot uh, guard the, the, the borders of their, own, of their own union. And of course, there's always people who are ready to take advantage of that. Uh, to a great extent, I will say something provocative here, but bear with me, I'll explain what I mean. To a great extent, that is, uh, that is a product of a virtue which uh, we call tolerance. To me, tolerance, not only to me, I think this is, this is well understood, tolerance is a passive virtue. Uh, you, can tolerate, you can tolerate something you think is not on your level, something that is something there. You can tolerate it, leave it aside, don't pay attention to it. You don't treat humans like that. You don't treat being refugees or migrants or anything uh, like in, in this manner. The virtue we need to start applying is respect. Respect is a, an active virtue. You give respect, but you demand it as well. You give respect gives protection, but demands protection as well. Globally, for a lot of people, uh, globally for uh, for a lot of people, change in in today's world uh, means and signifies changing one's country, not changing one's government. People started leaving their countries in order to change their own life and stop caring about fighting for uh, changing the system in their own country. It is easier and it is facilitated by, by the modern technology. 
And very often we hear that, uh, the, that they tell us liberal democracy fails, it doesn't work, uh, the efficiency of liberal democracy in its institutions is lowering down and so on. The migration crisis, though, uh, demonstrates exactly the opposite. People from other parts of the world are drawn to democracies, not only to Europe, to the United States, to Canada, to Australia, uh, you name it. Uh, they are drawn to democracies which uh, undoubtedly create wealth, give opportunities, protect rights, assure security. Only part of those who migrate are refugees, uh, which of course need protection. Most of them are actually economic migrants. People run away not only from guns and wars, but also from endemic corruption, dysfunctional institutions, lack of economic and intellectual freedom. Besides creating secure outer borders, Europe needs to focus attention and resources towards institution building and good governance practices beyond, beyond its borders. It is not enough for us to secure our borders. We need to work actively beside, outside our borders in order to, uh, to, to make uh, other countries more functional, more institutionally capable, uh, more capable of protecting their own citizens and assuring for them uh, everything which uh, we as, as Europeans uh, enjoy in a democracy. Redefining and establishing common migration policies which correspond to the contemporary challenges is one of the biggest task, tasks of today in front of the European Union. Uh, then we hear the roar around the growing financial disparities and the irresponsible financial elites. And I have to tell you that to a great extent I agree with that. Uh, and the, the crisis of 2008-2009, uh, 10 years ago, showed that we need to work on, on uh, more uh, regulations when it comes to financial systems. Because abuse of, uh, of the capitalist system, abuse of economic freedom, is also a problem. Um, global markets, and we, we, imagined, uh, we imagined that when, um, in the beginning of the 90s, we imagined that through free market, we can export also our values. That, that, free, that the free market can, can become a vehicle for our values. That turned out to be wrong, that concept failed, we need to change our approach to that. Because uh, we only gave autocrats resources in order to, uh, to, to oppress more their own people and to even come back at us and start destabilizing democracies. Uh, the biggest question uh, for me, when it comes to the narrative of the, of the populists, which bring out this, this, uh, this question about the financial elites and, uh, and, and uh, uh, the, the dismantling the crony capitalism and the administrative state, is uh, besides that, if they want to dismantle the crony capitalism, uh, besides that, do they intend to dismantle um, uh, all, also all the achievements of liberal democracies like the rule of law, freedom of speech, separation and division of powers, fundamental checks and balances, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is not the first time in history, though, when crooks, wannabe dictators, political adventurers, uh, have tried to turn history around. They were wrong then, they are wrong now as well. But we need to uh, somehow understand that and politically, actively, uh, politically active people need to fight for, uh, for, for uh, all these, for the soul of Europe, for, for liberal democratic values. Uh, but very often the populists turn out to be more capable of feeling the, uh, with their skin, they, they um, turn out to be more capable to, uh, to, to uh, f feel the sentiment of the people, to, to see what's going on in the ground, and sometimes educated, very uh, good politicians, meritocratic politicians, are, not, uh, are a little bit detached. I'm finishing, I know that we don't have a lot of time. Uh, in the end, a little bit of an optimistic note. Uh, very often we ask ourselves, how could populism be defeated? 
maybe the answer is not to try and defeat the enemies of the European Union in this case, but to exhaust them and even adopt policies which tackle the core issues uh, those populists ride on. For example, focusing on ensuring well-protected external borders, maybe even rethink some of the trade policies and in general the cooperation with autocratic governments. In, uh, it is time for heavy recapitulation and reckoning for the European Union. I don't think that we should even fear partial disintegration of some common policies. At the same time, there are areas where further integration is possible and expected by the European citizens. Uh, even if that creates the possibility for the appearance of some kind of two-speed Europe. If the core countries plus others which are ready, many, uh, which are ready manage to create a certain type of stronger integrational policies in various areas that might result in the appearance uh, uh, in, the, in a stronger gravitational force for others in the community to catch up. That's how actually I sensed uh, in Bulgaria that uh, uh, European integration was, was desired and demanded. Other countries have better functioning institutions, better functioning countries, we won't like that. Uh, if, if, uh, even if with the risk of creating two-speed Europe, which a lot of people are afraid of, but if, if something works within a smaller group of countries which are ready to do it, others will follow, others will gravitate around that. Apologize that I took a lot of time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel Mitov. I know that we are horribly over time, but still, uh, coffee will be there also a bit later, but our guests won't. So using my position here as a moderator, I would um, like to take up um, one thing that Daniel Mitov, he also said. He was speaking about uh, tolerance. This was actually very interesting because um, Angela Merkel said when she was uh, 10 days ago speaking in front of the European Parliament that the soul of Europe is tolerance. And I was then reminded of the case of Asia Bibi uh, a Pakistani woman who belongs to the Christian minority and who was uh, sentenced to death um, because she was accused of blasphemy. And a lot of um, European politicians and institutions advocated in her favor and also asked Pakistan to be religiously tolerant. And as it is such a topicality, sure, I also had a look at the Migration Compact. And it says that one of its aims is um, to fight intolerance against migrants. Uh, with that, we heard um, Daniel Mitov's thoughts uh, about uh, tolerance. You can surely add something if you want. But yeah, I address my question directly to our other two panelists, would you agree with Angela Merkel that Europe's soul is uh, tolerance? And how would you define this uh, tolerance? Or how would you understand that word Angela Merkel said? Thank you. And uh, maybe I'll give the floor here first to uh, Urmas Weinsal, Minister of Justice. And then. I think uh, this is not the European category, if we're speaking. Well, I, I do not understand how we will link uh, tolerance as an a, a, a exclusively European uh, <laughs> issue. So the, from that viewpoint, this is wrong. From another viewpoint, this word is very euphemistical to speak. Uh, this is a so uh, overloaded meaning that you can put everything to that. To speak about the universal core platform of Europe, I would say respect to human dignity. This is a core we are based. And uh, this tolerance has turned to be used, as we see, a left-wing philosopher's a, a core, one of the core uh, war slogans, a tolerance. And so this is something I would not uh, surely define Europe. Thank you very much, Judge. Uh, yeah, I fully agree with you. But uh, for other hand, of course, 
uh, if Ang for Angela Merkel is important, the tolerance I fully, fully understand. But it's, uh, I would say the Europe uh, challenging with the border of tolerance. And of course, uh, every, everything has its uh, own borders. And uh, tolerance uh, uh, can easily disturb uh, the misinterpreting or misinterpreted tolerance can disturb uh, my own freedom or your freedom. Uh, I think uh, uh, with uh, Asia Bibi uh, and uh, to force tolerance in, the, uh, in Pakistan is a total European mistake. The problem is that we fight very controversially for the values. Never seen in any kind of protocols about negotiation with Pakistan to force uh, for the European level or maybe member states uh, force the religious freedom in Pakistan. And that's the problem. We ask for, please, <laughs> please uh, uh, be tolerant with uh, Asia Bibi, but uh, we have good business in Pakistan. Mm -hmm. Every European country has a good business of base of oil and the textile industry and different reasons. And Asia Bibi to be free is absolutely it's not, a, not a priority. And we can go further in the Middle East with this concept, but I stop it. May, may I add something to what you said, because I agree completely. Uh, that, that's exactly how we lose our soul. When we, declare, when we declare that we believe in something, and then because we make money with, with people who don't respect that something, we are ready to give up whatever we, uh, we believe in, uh, in order to, uh, to continue doing business as usual. Uh, there are a lot of temptations, even right now, uh, to, uh, in, in some countries, to go back to business as usual with the Kremlin. Uh, even if we know what, clearly what the international law says, even if we know very well where we stand on Crimea and on Donbass and, and on other issues, uh, but the temptations are there. Uh, and rightly so, very often, our own citizens see everything which the European politicians express in terms of values, in terms of a certain type of approach, as hypocritical. Because once, once we can implement certain type of, uh, of values uh, towards certain uh, external actors, and another time when it is uh, not, very, uh, not very comfortable, in monetary terms very often, we, we choose to close our eyes. That's how we lose our soul. Thank you very much. Yeah, sure. But, uh, well, yes. to be uh, still realistic, this is not an issue of uh, an, uh, current situation, I often think, uh, as it has been in uh, human history of politics. It has been a certain uh, one thing is indeed the practical issues of Earth, and another is indeed uh, eternal uh, values. And uh, so, uh, one thing is what we believe, uh, and uh, the, another thing is also, do we have enough courage to stand for that, what we believe? Do we believe China occupies Tibet? <laughs> do we believe uh, Russia occupies Crimea? Do we believe uh, Russia, well, by the transition or formation, occupies part of uh, Georgia. So this is, uh, these are actually questions uh, which uh, uh, the one thing is a reality, another thing is ideals. And so, of course, never should reality win ideals. But also, as I agree with you, ideas will uh, lose the value. They will be like, uh, not Deutschmark, but Easternmark <laughs> by the currency, if you are, uh, are too passive, or too passive. Thank you for all of your thoughts. Head kuulajad, ma tean, et me oleme üle aja, aga nagu öeldud, ka teile tahan ma anda võimaluse, kellegil on võib olla veel mõni küsimus meie panelistidele, kui ta soovib, siis ma palan tõske kätt, esitage küsimus, õlge põgusalt, kes teie olete ja kellel te sooviksid vastust saada. Aten, et te olete kõik väga taga. Ah, seal taga ikkagi. Palu. 
Ma ei, ah, siin on eks mikrofon. Siit tuleb teile, tulleks teile. Vabandus, väga, ja. siin puudub ei, tõlge, ei, kas teil juhtub, ja. kas te oskate juhtumise ka inglis? Jah, oskan küll, võib. Võib olla, et saate, ah, aga siin tuleb tõlge Aha. ka. Nii, et saime juba probleemi lähenud. Äh, mu nimi on Tõnu Kalvet, olen vabakutseline ajakirjanik. Jah, üks hetk palun, seal puudub ka veel üks. Võib, jah. <laughs> Rääkige, ma arvan. Ja arvan, küsimus on selline, kas olete märganud silmakirjalikust seoses rände leppega, kui öeldakse, et Ungari on paha, Poola on paha, sest ei liitu sellega. Aga öeldak, jätaks ütlemata, et sellega ei ole liitunud näiteks meie suurim liitlan USA või sellega ei kavatse liituda ka Iisrael. Siis tekib küsimus, et millest selline standardite kasutamine, eriti meie peavolu ajakirjanduses. Ja küsimus ongi, et kas olete seda märganud ja kui jah, siis Mis te arvate, kaua selline standardit kasutamine veel kestab? Aitäh. Kas küsimus on esitatud kõikidele panelid? Kõikidele. Aitäh teile. I, I think you... Is there anyone who would like to... Well, I, I just comment. Uh, the think... Colleagues might not uh, like catch the point uh, in the first hand. Uh, in Estonia, uh, politi several politicians and officials have used uh, it as an argument pro-migration compact that if we will not sign it, so there will be eternal shame. We will be the same club with Hungary and Poland, and it will be like a totally uh, end, uh, end of our uh, rule of law course, what we have uh, hold here, and the uh, free uh, foreign policy concept of, uh, of uh, Western orientation. And surely the one thing is uh, rule of law issues, the issues of democracy, what uh, our friends are dealing with, and this uh, solution is indeed a respectable uh, dialogue with European institutions. But another thing is uh, the right of sovereign country join or not to join to international treaties. This is a core idea of sovereignty. And if this is done by democratic uh, procedure, this is not something uh, you should, it is possible to criticize by that platform. And the truth is, that uh, now, for now uh, about seven European Union countries have declared that they will not uh, join to that compact and the debate is going on uh, at least in three countries that have, as I have uh, uh, calculated. Just as a right. short explanation. Very, very white countries are uh, deeply involved uh, and fully agree that every head has a right to take it, this kind of decision and other kind of decision. The US uh, done this kind of decision, or Israel, or Hungary, or uh, other countries inside the EU, that is a free of choice. Of course, the logic is different, uh, uh, was in Hungary. We are facing for years, the, the international pocket exists, absolutely clear powers, they think, find the migration uh, positive, or has uh, positive, very, very, very positive aspects. And the problem is here, and this is my own uh, own experience. I am frequently a student who very well uh, in the Middle East, in Africa. That we we should we should know it. That we shouldn't sign for pe those people we are suffering. Uh, that we are able to take it, and we are able to fulfill the wishes of this uh, people for other part of the world. The controversial things is for me that we, why is that that we are for years are not able to make a difference between real refugees, their own life is in danger, and between migration. That we are not do it, we will totally in Europe overloaded with different, with this kind of problem, this kind of, uh, 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 this kind of uh, uh, challenges, and the problem is there that this uh, GCM, uh, this GCM is uh, not serve the solution uh, of the countries. It's no solution, and no, the no solution in the Europe for these countries. Its only solution exists there, 
uh, for example, concrete example, I was last, uh, last time in Chad, Chad Lake, you know it. And the Chad Lake, and the bit, there's a border lake between three countries, Nigeria, Nigeria, and uh, Chad, of course. And uh, thanks for the uh, climate changes, uh, came back from two, uh, 22,000 uh, 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 square kilometer to 1,300. Absolutely uh, really possible to make high level of horticulture, agriculture, cultivate uh, so horticulture uh, 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 things there. But the lack of the security, the lack of the security uh, not allowed for the people to go there and work there. And what the solution? And for me in my life, it's not only this kind of solution. I go there to help and create the security there, or try to, how would you say, um, uh, to create uh, millions of migrants and, uh, and try to sell such a kind of ideology what never can be fulfilled. Europe doesn't need, Europe doesn't need uh, equal citizens. Europe has a need for work, and Europe needs second and third ranking uh, citizens. That's the problem. Thank you. Um, uh, very shortly, uh, a lot has been said. Uh, of course, a framework on migration and refugee, a new one, is needed. Uh, the, the last one we have, I think, was adopted in 1951. Uh, it is old, it does not reflect at all uh, the contemporary challenges, uh, and <coughs> a lot of us were surprised to find out that uh, throughout the, since 1951, again if I'm not mistaken, uh, till nowadays, there were at least 73 to 75 uh, registered, officially registered attempts to use displaced people with political, uh, political uh, as political weapon in in various ways to to literally uh, intentionally displace people in other countries in order to afterwards uh, influence the local politics. Seventy five attempts like that registered officially. There might be even more. Uh, that that is something that has never worked, obviously. Uh, it gave the chance to, to uh, asylum seekers who, who were, uh, and, and refugees from the communist regime to, uh, to gain uh, asylum um, in, in democracies. That was wonderful. But besides that, I don't think it has ever really worked well. In today's world, in the contemporary um, uh, circumstances, uh, this framework is completely and utterly old. Uh, what I'm more concerned about, I'm not concerned about the, the, the current, uh, whoever wants to join it, whoever wants to, to stay out, uh, that, that's uh, to, to me quite, uh, quite uh, not interesting, to be fair. What I'm concerned about is what are we doing inside the European Union to solve this, uh, this issue. Uh, is, is, is the Dublin regulation going to take another shape? Is the, uh, the, the, are we going to, to pay more attention uh, and focus our attention on the outer borders? Are we going to be, uh, to be responsible and responsive to our citizens who would like to see a clear framework which protects our borders, which protects the European borders, and which uh, controls uh, all, these, uh, all these processes? Thank you very much. I think what are my flames and I wanted to say very briefly? Uh, well, the borders, I think this is now, at least in rhetorics, there's a consensus. What we didn't uh, have some years ago, uh, and you're looking also the debate, vital debate, about the uh, effective control. But look to the, indeed, you took it to the eternal or uh, century perspective. Look uh, just United Nations demographics uh, prognosis, which says that now in European soil, uh, lives 500 million people, and in African soil, 600 million people. In 2100, in European soil, lives 600 million people, 
and in African soil, million. six billion people, six billion people. So uh, this is something we say that this was not even a prelude what we had uh, uh, two years ago, a year ago, or currently have. This is a philosophical, para paradigmatical question. So this paradigm of details, Dublin regulation, etc., this is not actually a uh, mm, option to deal with basically uh, the global trend. The global trend needs a different paradigm, and we, this is actually something we need to speak honestly. The old philosophy of United Nations Refugee Convention, indeed, which, which was raised after the Second World War, uh, horrible times, this is actually not, uh, is not functional anymore because no of the uh, trends what we've seen on globe. Thank you sorry, sorry, very sorry, much. Uh, uh, like no, very, brief. very short. Very sorry, brief, you please. are very polite. Uh, I, I know. appreciate it. Sorry. Almost poor people, <laughs> I think. Uh, no, no, no. What's maybe it's not uh, irrelevant what I try to say. Uh, uh, what uh, your, you mentioned, this is absolutely a crucial question about the tendencies. Especially on this reason, we have to take seriously Africa. And we have to take seriously African, and we have to go there and help there. But not with the post colonial effects that we have to get African partners. And for example, especially the Germans, but they are trying to do it, GIZ. It's, it's absolutely historical. I don't glorify the Germans so normally. But it's really what they are doing then. This is a new approach. And not only the territory of the post-colonial trauma uh, to, to do something and involve the Central Eastern European countries in this business. Sorry. Thank you very much. So with this, really, thank you also very much to the panelists for our discussion today. Um, head kuulajad, te tõesti saate nüüd um, oma kofi juurde ja ma vabandan, et me oleme nii palju üle aja. Võiks arvata meie arutelu alusel, et migratsioon ongi Euroopa hing. Ma saan siiski aru nii, et... Um, Migratsioon on küsimus, mis on meie kõige hinge peal ning sellepärast ongi oluline, et me arutame seda ja me ei saa kuidagi teisiti, kui seda arutada ja ma arvan, et see ongi demokraatia ja Euroopa kõige suurem ohtena, et me ei aruta enam asju nii nagu me peaks nagu tegelikult demokraatimelt nõuab, et meil võivadki olla erinevad seisukohad, aga et me peame vastutustundlikult arutama ja leidma kompromissi ja ma kardan, et tihti seda ei ole tahetud enam teha, tahetakse lihtsalt inimeste emotsioonidega võimu haarata ja sellepärast ma täna on väga korraldajaid ka meid siia kutsumast, täna on väga paneliste, sest ma arvan, et see ongi osa sellest demokraatlikust arutelust, mida me peame kindlasti elus hoidma. Aitäh teile! Well, thank you. Well, thank you very much.